Okay, good morning everybody. Um, what we're talking about, we have been talking about for a little bit, it's about the harvest, and it's about God's heart in the harvest. And if harvest is on the mind and heart of God, I believe it's the last great harvest of the earth. And if it's on God's heart and mind, I think it should be on ours, just Absolutely. as strong as it is on His. And it seems like people that are in tune with what's going on in the Spirit, that's what they're hearing. It's the great, the last great harvest of the earth. And we need to be on the same page as the Lord. And um, as I was preparing this, the Lord reminded me of a couple of things. He reminded me of, in the 80s and early 90s, I taught Sunday school for six years. And sometimes I taught every week. I would be downstairs with the kids. And I prepared for them about as much as I prepare for you all. I've spent hours before the Lord. I'd, I'd pray about it. I'd be in that classroom Number six, classroom six, and we reviewed, that was the prayer room too, it was my Sunday school classroom, so there was always a strong anointing in there. And I would pray sometimes, uh, Grant, I'm not for sure if you were in this class or not, that the one that we took about a month to build Noah's Ark full of popsicle sticks. Yeah, yeah. So we built Noah's Ark full of popsicle sticks, we took a month and built pieces and we glued it all together. Then I took the Sunday school out to the river and we put, set it free and we rained fire and brimstone on it from we threw rocks at it uh, did we set it on fire i'm not sure i couldn't remember that part but we did we did throw rocks at it till it sunk that didn't happen biblically but that's what we did with my sunday school class but also uh, when i taught him about evangelism and hell um I was the kind of Sunday school teacher that uh, would take them out and about. So I took them to Edgewood, which was a rough place, and we handed out tracks at a shopping center, a strip mall there, and we handed out tracks. And I remember, because they were so serious about what they had been learning about heaven and hell and about being saved, and they were serious that they took these tracks and they weren't embarrassed, and they weren't shy. They ran up to people and gave them these tracts. Sometimes they talked to them, sometimes they just gave them a tract. Children, 10, 11, 12. That was my favorite class. And, and some of them ran to people. And some of them were weeping as they came. And they were serious about it. And I think the church has lost a lot of their seriousness about this. And this is a very serious season for praying for the lost and the backslidden and the spiritually cold people and taking advantage of every open door that the Lord gives us. We need to not let them pass. We need to take advantage of them. Every opportunity to witness because your witness is the power of God displayed. It really is. God will use your witness and your testimony and put his power on it. Because this is the season that we're in. It's harvest season. Mm -hmm. And we go through a lot of seasons in our walk with God. And looking back, I can see them. And I put some, I didn't put them in, I put them in a, like a category so you could see. Um, and these seasons that every person, every Christian that's serious about the things of God, they're going to go through these. Some people get kind of stuck in some. And never move on. And to be honest, I wonder about people that never seem to grow in the things of God. I wonder about them. Uh, they don't have a big interest in the things of God. They never feed their spirit. You know what I mean by that is read their Bible. Their prayer life is very shallow if they even have one. I wonder if they really know God. Does that those those things matter to the Lord, you think? Oh, yeah. Bring the first scripture up, Chris. It says this. Did it lock up? Yeah. Okay. Well, even when you have challenges, when a meet we can bring it. It says, this is the words of Jesus. He said, Not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that does the will of my Father, which is in heaven. 
Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied your name? And in your name have cast out devils, and in your name have done many wonderful works. And I, this is Jesus, will profess to them, I never knew you. I never had that kind of relationship with you. Now, I saw a survey this week from the Barna Survey Group. Anybody know that's a Christian company that does surveys in churches? And this is what the survey was about. How people think being a good person or having good works will get you to heaven. And you'll be surprised. Pentecostals, who should know better, 44, no, 46% of Pentecostals think that good works and being a good person will get you to heaven. 44% of Protestant, that's the mainline denominations, Baptist, Methodist, Episcopal, Lutheran kind of thing, 44% of them and 70% of Catholics believe that just being a good person and doing good works will get you to heaven. And I want you to understand today that you can be the best person on the earth. Do good works from the time you get up in the morning to the time you go to bed at night and that will not get you with heaven. It's only by the blood of Jesus Christ. Nothing that you can do. No. If you could have done it, God would have made a way for you to do it. But he made a way for his son and his blood to sanctify you and make you holy in his sight. Forgiveness of sins. That's the only way. But Jesus said that we should have good work. <coughs> and we should be good people. He said, a tree is known by the fruits mm -hmm. it bears. And there are certain fruits to relationship that we have in certain seasons that we go through. Chris, bring the first one up, please. First season that every Christian goes through, every Christian, is the season to get to know who you are. And to know that you are a new creation in Christ Jesus. To know that you're sons and daughters now of the Most High God. To know that the old things are behind you and all things have become new. To know that you're free from every bondage by the blood in the name of Jesus. That's the season everybody comes to the Lord, comes in this season. Know that you're kings and priests. And there's so much grace in this season. Uh, new faith, new belief. It seems like Everything that you pray for and everybody that you pray for, God's answering your prayer. And he does that because by that, you get to see how good he is. You get to see how real he is. You get to establish that relationship with him. And it was a, it's a season of ease. And it caused us, and I call it new faith, because new faith believes God can do anything. Somewhere along the line, we get preached to that, and then we forget that, that God can do anything at any time with anybody, and all he wants you to do is ask him. All he wants you to do is get him involved in your life. And it's more than, Lord, help. It's more than that. The next season, Chris, is knowing your inheritance and what belongs to you. As far as the promises in the Word of God, if you really know the Word of God and really get it down inside of you, like a sponge that's dipped in water and lifted up, when the pressures of life squeeze you, whatever's in you is going to come out. If the Word of God and His promises are in you, no matter what it is, it'll come out under pressure. The first thing that comes out, how do you know what's in you? The first thing that comes out of you in a pressure situation is what's in you in abundance. If it's the word of God, if it's the promises of God, that's a good thing. But what if it's fear? But what if it's unbelief? What if it's doubt? That just means that you're not feeding yourself. You're not putting enough of the good stuff in. Because when good stuff goes in, what comes out? Good stuff. Good, good stuff. stuff. When, that's when you know that the Word of God is actually starting to work for you in your life. When it starts coming out. When you open your mouth and your eyes are open to spiritual truth, the Word works when you work the Word. 
Listen to that again. The Word of God works when you work the Word of God. Amen. Word of God has an inheritance. Chris, bring the scripture up. It says this, God has an inheritance stored up for you in heaven where it will never decay or be ruined or disappear. You know what the only problem with that is? And people have no argument with this part. They, well, God's got an inheritance laid up for me in heaven. The only problem is people don't know how to get it here on earth where you need it. You're not going to need provision. You're not going to need healing. You're not going to need a lot of things when you get to heaven. You're not going to need them. But you need them now, and you better know how to get your inheritance. God has a great benefit package, and he doesn't want you to forget it. Who had to worry about memory? It was Karen. Psalm 103 says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, mind, will, and emotions, and all within me, bless his holy name. And forget not all his benefits. And then it goes ahead and lists all the benefits that God has for you. He forgives all your sin and iniquity. He heals all your diseases. He crowns your life with loving kindness, tender mercy, redeems your life from destruction, satisfies your mouth with good things, renews your youth like an eagle's. He does all these things. I can go on and on. Removes your sin as far as the east is from the west. I can go on and on in that thing, but we're not, we're not getting the benefits that heaven has for us like we should. Don't shout me down. The next season, Chris, go ahead, is knowing your authority. And I would say after season one and season two, it sounds like a TV show, doesn't it? <laughs> after season one and season two, very few Christians ever get here True. to know their authority in the earth. And that's because they've been taught wrong. And let me prove it to you. How many people have said to themselves, God's in control, including me, including most of the Christians have said, you know, God's in control like he's controlling everything. When, he, when I ate uh, uh, my breakfast this morning, I had a free choice whether to eat a hamburger or a, a hot dog on a stick. That's what I had available. I had a free choice. He didn't control what I ate. He doesn't control what you do either. You submit to him, right? He doesn't control it. God's not in control, but he is in charge. But he's given authority on the earth to us. And I want to prove it to you. Get it down inside of you right now. Chris, bring the first scripture up. God said, let make man in our own image after our likeness and let them have dominion. Over to let them, dominion means to rule and reign over, take control of, and bring it under subjection to what you want. Let them have dominion over fish in the sea, over foul air, over cattle, over all the earth, yes. and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. Creeps. All the creeps, you're right. <laughs> so, so we do have dominion over creeps too. Yes, but listen, very few Christians ever learn this. One of the things I learned when I was a young Christian, very kind of like we were youth pastors, and it was late 80s, early 90s sometime, and we took the kids on a camping trip. And when we got there, I told you, it started raining, and it was supposed to rain all weekend. And this was, you know, we were, as we were setting up our tents, it was raining, and we didn't want to get in a wet tent. We couldn't do anything outside. So us and about a dozen kids got to a circle, held hands, and we asked the Lord, and some of us commanded it, to stop rain. And instantly, the rain stopped. You said, well, that's just a coincidence. How much of a coincidence is it rained everywhere around the park where we was all weekend long, but it didn't rain where we were one time? It was a circle of dryness where we were. But we could go out and, and play outside and stuff like that and go swimming even. But it wasn't raining where we were. How many? So that was back then. But we, I learned that lesson that we have authority. And somebody that lives in the Midwest should start operating their authority and ask for rain, right? You know, Elijah was a man just like us. And he prayed that earnestly that it wouldn't rain for the space of three and a half years, and it didn't. He told the king, it's not going to rain until I say so. He didn't say it was not going to rain until God says so. He said it's not going to rain until I say so. And, and the Bible says he's a man just like us. 
So we know from all the times we've had this, every time we've ever had a back-to-school event, we've, we prayed that Wednesday night, it either rained right after or right before, but never during. We were able to tear down, and as soon as we got the last thing in the truck, boom, it started coming. But that's what we asked for. When we had, two years ago, when we were forced to have our outside services for five weeks, every week but one was supposed to rain. And guess what? It did rain. But it never rained when we were having our services. It rained before. It rained after. It never rained during. Because you know why? Because we exercised our authority in that realm. We were just on vacation in Alabama, Gulf Shores, and it was supposed to rain every day. And we were like, Lord, they need rain. Let it rain, but not when we're out. So every time that we were out enjoying the weather, enjoying it and stuff like that, and as soon as we would go in, a quick thunderstorm would go blow through, and then when, by the time we went out to dinner, it stopped again. And it's just exercising your authority. If, it, if God will work that in the earth, what else will he do with, with something as difficult, as unpredictable as people think weather is? What will he do with other things? Chris, bring the next scripture up. Um, this is the convincing part. The heavens belong to our God. They are in his alone but he has given us the earth and put us in charge. We are to use his words, use his promises to bring things to pass. If he didn't want you to use it, he would have never told you to do it. Now, I have a scripture that explains this. Chris, bring it up. The next. Now, I want you to, to read along with this with me, but let it get down inside of you. Get it. Understand it. It's Isaiah 55, 10, and 11. It says, Rain and snow fall from the sky and don't return until they water the ground. Then the ground causes the plants to sprout and grow, and they produce seeds for the farmer and food for people to eat. In the same way, my words leave my mouth seeds. And they don't come back without results, food or provision, whatever your provision is. My words make things happen that I want to happen. They succeed in what I send them to do. This is God saying that what is the power of his word, when he speaks it, do you have any doubt that when God says something, it happens? Right. How about when you use his words and speak them forth, Amen. you have seeds going out in your mouth. And I'm asking you today, what kind of seeds are you planting? Are you planting seeds of faith? Are you planting seed positive seeds? Are you planting seeds of life? Or are you planting seeds of death? Because you can look back behind you at what your crop is, and you can see what kind of seeds you sow. Don't shout me down. That's true. The Bible says life and death, actually it says death and life are in the power of the tongue. And he that loves it will eat the fruit of it. That's, that's a real thing. We need to start watching our P's and Q's, but watching more of our words coming out of our mouths. Do not speak death into a situation. Speak life into a situation. You're having a hard time with people. You're having a hard time at work. You're having a hard time with this. It, how, good, how much grace has he given you to talk about the problem? What did Jesus say to do? He says, if there's a yes. mountain in your way, Speak to it and say what? Be removed. Be cast in the sea. Don't doubt in your heart, but believe the things you say will come to pass, and you shall have what you say. And what did James say about somebody who speaks one way and then speaks the other? Bitter water and sweet coming out of the same fountain. He says you're double-minded, and you won't receive anything from the Lord. But I tell you who you will receive from, the devil. The devil's waiting for you to speak death out of your mouth so he can try to make it happen. See, he doesn't have any power unless you give it to him to make things That's like right. that happen. Next season, 
is the season where you discover your purpose. If very few Christians ever know their authority, even less seem to discover their purpose in life. And they, a lot of people go their whole life not knowing that God has a plan for them that will totally fulfill them and satisfy them like nothing else. Everybody knows Jeremiah 29, 11. I know the plans I, that I have for you, saith the Lord. Plans to give you hope and a future that you desire. Plans of peace so nothing's missing, nothing's broken in your life. But in that plan, listen, in that plan comes your assignment. If you don't take up your assignment and work your assignment from the Lord, the plan for your life cannot come to pass. You have an assignment. And it's from the Lord. Not only does he have a plan, and then he tells you how to get that to that plan. Seek me and you'll find me when you seek me with all your heart. If you really want to be in the will of God, seek him. Listen to him, what he says for you to do, and that's your assignment. Your assignment might not last forever. Your assignment might be a season, but do your assignment. That's right. If you miss your assignment, you'll miss the purpose that God has for you. You're called into the kingdom for more than making heaven when you die. Amen. Paul said this, he said, I have ran the race, I finished my course, I won the prize because I raced to win. How are you running in your purpose from God? Are you using everything he's given you to complete your assignment? The fifth season is a lifelong season. This one lasts you your whole life. And it's growing in your relationship uh, with the Lord and growing in faith. As you get to know how God, how good God is, and how you can trust him and trust his word, you start to hear better from heaven. That's, that's worth more than gold to you, people, is being the ability to hear God speak to you. Jesus is a voice to hear from heaven. You stay hungry for his presence. You want to hang out with him every day. And if you don't spend time with the Lord in a day, you miss it. And worship becomes more than what you do a few minutes on Sunday. It becomes a lifestyle for you. Because, and the reason is because you're so faith, uh, thankful to him for all his goodness in your life yeah. that you can't help but worship. That's right. It doesn't mean that you play an instrument. It doesn't mean that you have worship is expressed in those things. But worship is a matter of the heart, yes. being thankful for who God is from the heart. And that's your lifestyle. Uh, it's not a, I have to hurry up and read 10 chapters. I have to pray for an hour. No. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be a list of times that you do this. You're just hungry for the presence of God, yeah. and you want it, and you'll take it however you can get it, through the preach word, through reading the word, through prayer, through worship. You're hungry for God. You'll take whatever you can get Amen. for his presence. Amen. Now, I said all that to say this. The season that we're in right now is the season of harvest. And when we work and cooperate with God, he takes all these things and lets us use them in this season. That was a big revelation for me. Maybe that, let me say it again. Let me get some light bulbs in your head. When we realize what season we are in and cooperate with the Spirit of God in that season, he takes all these other seasons and lets us use every gift every testimony, every ministry, every whatever we have, he lets us use them to work the season that we're in. That's, that's good stuff. Hallelujah. Turn with me in your Bibles today to 2 Timothy chapter 2. Let me see the people, the hands of people who would like to make an impact for the kingdom of God. You just want more than heaven, right? You want to make an impact for the kingdom of God. So if you do, what I've just told you were the seasons we went through in this 
last season, this is some of the things we're going to have to look out for in this season. Last days, harvest season. 2 Timothy chapter 3, let's go to verse 1. But you need to be aware that in the final days, the culture of society will become extremely fierce and difficult for the people of God. Let me read that to you again. But I want you to be aware of this. In the final days, in the last days, the culture, isn't that a word we use a lot now? Of society will become extremely fierce and difficult for the people of God. People will be self-centered, lovers of themselves, obsessed with money. They will boast of great things as they strut around in their arrogant pride and mock all that's right. Sounds like Washington, D.C. or government. They will ignore their own families. They will be ungrateful and ungodly. They will become addicted to hateful and malicious slander. Slaves to their desires, they will be ferocious, belligerent haters of what is good and right. With brutal treachery, they will act without restraint, bigoted and wrapped in clouds of their own conceit. They will find their delight in the pleasures of this world more than the pleasures of loving God. They might pretend to have a respect for God, but in reality, they want nothing to do with God's power. Stay away from people like that. Now turn backwards in your Bible to 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. Just back a few pages. And because of what we just read, I want you to see this is the influence on the church. It says, the Spirit says clearly that some people will abandon the faith in later times. They will obey lying spirits and follow the teachings of demons. Such teachings are spread by deceitful liars whose consciences are dead as if burnt with a hot iron. Such people teach that it's wrong to marry. Marriage is a big thing right now in the news. And to eat certain foods, that is too. But God created those foods to be eaten after a prayer of thanks by those who are believers and have come to know the truth. Everything that God has created is good. Nothing to be rejected, but everything is to be received with a prayer of thanks because the word of God and the prayer make it acceptable to God. If you teach these things to other followers, you're going to be a good servant in Christ Jesus. You will show that you have grown up with the teachings about faith and good instructions you have obeyed. Now look at me for a second. Just like what we just read are things happening in the world and happening in the church. Matthew 24, Luke 21 are pictures of what's going to be happening in the world right before Jesus comes back. You know, the earthquakes, the wars, the rumors of wars, the now we're seeing the famine, right? That was, that's a snapshot given to us by Jesus. Revelations chapter 2 and 3 are snapshots of what's going to be happening in the church right before Jesus gets ready to come back. And what we just read is a snapshot of the culture of society right before Jesus comes back. It's so woke. It's upside down. It's backwards. It's evil being called good and good evil. But Paul tells Timothy in that, that even though you're seeing all this kind of stuff, that you can still have a powerful impact right in the middle of it. You can be lights in darkness and let your light shine. You can change your environment around you. Because right now in this season of harvest, seduction and deception are strong and they're st stronger than it's ever been in our lifetime. The Bible calls it doctrines of devils. So we know where it's coming from. And there's even a division in the church. You could expect it between the world and the church, but there's even a division in the church. All these different denominations are splitting over three different subjects. And there's compromise happening in churches right now big. Now, I don't go to any church but this one, except if I'm on vacation or I preach someplace else. But I watch different church services uh, 
on YouTube and stuff is up constantly. And I've noticed that there's a lot of people saying nothing right now, preaching for a long time but saying nothing. I also noticed that there's a lot of error right now, extra biblical. They take a truth in the Bible that might have one little sentence to it and they bring a doc make a doctrine out of it. And that's not, a, that's not a good thing. And I could name a whole bunch of them, I won't. Even if I step on your toes today, I believe God will heal them. All right, so the three biggest areas of compromise, even in the church and in the culture of society right now, are LGBTQ. Right now, I read that there are up to 81 different genders. As a matter of fact, we're at worship practice. The other night, Kenny told me some school in Virginia, some teacher identified identified as a cat. Karen. Oh, Karen, of course. So somebody, a teacher in Virginia identified as a cat, and she held on to it so long they put a litter box in the bathroom. That's true. Okay. So, okay, so, you know, 81 different genders. Kenny told me, I'll give Kenny the credit for that, that Webster Dictionary changed the definition of a woman. They did. For forever, you know, and this, hey, listen, Webster Dictionary, this is what they're teaching to your kids in school. Even Powhatan schools are teaching about different genders. Eight, 81 of them. I can't even go past a, just a couple. So that's a big thing. Webster's Dictionary, uh, they say now, having a gender identity opposite of male is what a female, I mean, is what a woman is. So they, they added that, gender identity. So LGBTQ, gay marriage and gay and transgender being ordained into the ministry, uh, performing weddings, and the third thing is abortions. And churches are fighting over those things right now. They're fighting for the right to abort babies, saying it's a woman's right. But no one's asking. No, here's the big thing no one's asking. What does God think about that? Exactly. Come on. Well, I mean, we're churches. We worship God. That's true. What does God think about these things? No one asking him. Mm-hmm. And he's not going to change his mind or he's not going to change his word to fit the culture. Amen. So, Chris, bring the first thing up. We're going to see how God feels about this. And God created man in his image, and the image of God created him. He created them male male and female. I only see two. It's because God is not gender confused. He only made a man, and he only made a woman. They now call somebody, they all now say, and your government is saying this, it's calling people birthing people, and saying that a man can give birth. They don't have the organs to give birth. And I, I, and I really, seriously, I don't care what you feel like today. It's a poison that's crept into the church. Do you know how many pastors won't touch this because they're afraid to lose people and lose money? They won't touch this. And they won't preach these truths. And, cause, and just because somebody's pretending to be something that they are, aren't, doesn't mean that we have to pretend with them. That's right. uh, I'm, if, you, if you're a woman who who's, thinks you're a man and you shave your head and you try to grow a mustache and you take hormones to do all this kind of stuff, and, you, and you're, you look as close to a man and you even maybe cut off your breasts or something like that, guess what? You're still a woman pretending to be a man, and I'm not pretending with you. I might say you have a nice mustache, but that's as far as I'll go. (laughs) So how does God feel about those things? He doesn't accept it as normal. And guess what? Many Christians do. Here's what God thinks. Chris, bring it up. Listen to this. This is, this is word. This is what God says about it. For this reason, a God allowed their shameful passions to control them. Their women have exchanged nat- natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. 
Likewise, their men have given up natural sexual relations with women and burnt with lust for each other. Men commit indecent acts with men, so they experience among themselves the punishment they deserve for their perversion. How God thinks about it, shameful. How God thinks about it, unnatural. How God thinks about it, indecent. How God thinks about it, perverted. Case closed. You can go all through the Old Testament, and this, but this is New Testament, and this is not the only place it says this. But this is a one that tells you exactly how God feels about it. Doesn't it? Shameful, unnatural, indecent, perverted. And it says this, and I wasn't going to teach about this, but I will make mention. Go back up for this one. It says this. So they so they experience among themselves the punishment they deserve for their person. It does not say God is punishing them. Right. It says that their acts, the experience of their acts. Tammy was reading to me last night, monkeypox has made a big, 75 nations have experienced monkeypox. And, and what she has read about monkeypox is it basically happens to men who have sex with other men. Majority of it. But it can spread, but that's what it is, is a disease. With, how about AIDS? Do you know how many sexual diseases now can kill you? I can't even list them all. AIDS. People say, well, that's judgment from God. No, that's what your experience did for you and your punishment that you deserve from it. And it'll kill you. Oh, no kidding. We always give you. How are we supposed to deal with this? You don't hate the sinner. You hate the sin. You love the sinner. I get asked all the time, what if, what if a whole bunch of homosexuals and lesbians would come to church? We would love it. We invite you to come here. Are we going to throw rocks at them? No. We're going to tell them about the goodness of God. And I tell you, once you learn about the goodness of God, once you learn about his purpose for your life, you're going to want that more than you want the other thing. And guess what? God was delivering you. And they say, well, I was born this way. Wait a minute. It's true. They were born into sinful world, so they're capable of anything in that sinful world. Any kind of sin. But guess what? That was never God's design and purpose for them. Never. And they can be set free, just like somebody can be set free from drugs, somebody can be set free from alcohol, you can be set free from any kind of perversion or sin through the blood of Jesus. If you want it. So the Bible says God's the author of life. And when a woman gets pregnant, there's a divine spark. I've seen it before that happens, and it's awesome. I've seen it. It's just like a, a spark happens in the, in the womb, in the egg, and it's a divine spark. And a lot of, you know, they're saying right now the big thing is that... Um, <sighs> The creator is the one that creates life, but they're saying it's just a fetus, just a blob, just a mass, doesn't have any life. Yeah. And they're saying that um, they're saying it's a woman's right to choose. And they've been saying this. There's a lot of because there's a lot of terrible things like rape and like incest, but that doesn't mean it's the child and the woman's fault. Right. Right. Bring up the next scripture, Chris. It's, this is what the Lord says. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart for a holy purpose. I appointed you to be a prophet. That's what he said to Jeremiah. David said this, when you formed my inward parts, you knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Chris, real quick, can you bring up, Grant, help you um, put the sound on, bring up the one video I have. Turn it up so we can hear it. The pimp said you can't make any money having a baby in the oven. We have got to kill this baby. They kicked her in the stomach. They fed her alcohol. They gave her drugs. They took a hanger and stabbed the baby over and over again. But the baby would not die. Mm. The 
baby was born two months premature with no pancreas, a learning disability, a bladder too small, unable to function, a severe stutterer. We call it a trick baby. Nobody wants the baby. No hope, no future. Kill it was the word. That baby was me. I'm the lowest of the low. I come from the guttermost. I come from a hellish condition. And so when I would go to school, I couldn't talk. I stuttered so severely from the trauma. My mother had a madam who hated men. Her name was Dolores, and she was a sadist. And when she would watch me, she would take a broomstick and stick it in a place where no boy should have any object in his body. And when you are tortured like that, you learn four things. Don't talk. Don't trust. Don't feel and pretend nothing is happening. And by age 10, I had had enough. I wanted to die. And in my school, they put me in a boiler room with other kids who were dysfunctional like me, where we were finger paint all day long. And yet there was a teacher, thank God for her, who had a Gideon Bible. And she came to my school and she saw kids like me as her mission field. And she would give me this Gideon Bible and read to me stories of dysfunctional characters who God used. She would say to me, Ronaldo, God uses greatly those who have been wounded very deeply. He will turn your pain into power, your wounds into wisdom. She had me read the story of Moses, who was also a stutterer. I began to understand that God did love a trick baby, even as low as I was. There was hope for me and possibility. And when a child begins to understand the love of God and the power yeah. of his word and the possibilities, it changes everything. Yeah. How can a young man Keep his way clean by taking heed according to your word. Your word have I hid in my heart that I may not sin against thee. I began to memorize the Bible, that Gideon Bible, reading 2,000 scriptures. And when you put that kind of word in a life, something begins to happen. My stuttering went away. I stopped wetting the bed. I stood tall. I became valedictorian, became a pastor, and preached until... Everybody in my family got saved. Why? Because somebody placed a Gideon Bible in a woman's hand that changed a life forever. Yes, I was born a trick baby, but the trick was on the devil. Amen. <laughs> All right, bring, bring my sermon slides up, please, again. Hallelujah. So regardless of what happened, the life and purpose in it is from the Lord. And God wants us to be healers. He wants us to take a stand for life. We need to take that stand for life. We don't need to compromise. Jesus gave us life, and the devil tries to take it away. Jesus said, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. I've come to give life, to Zoe life, that more abundantly. And once you know and you're knower that that life is from God, hallelujah. And that's what we need to do. We need to minister life, healing to people. But at the same time, not to compromise our beliefs. These are the biggest things right now. Turn with me to 2 Timothy in your Bibles. We're not going to pass this in the last place today. 2 Timothy chapter 1, oh, except chapter 4, I'm sorry, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. Are you there? It says, Timothy, in the presence of our great God and the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who designed, destined to judge both the living and the dead by the revelation of his kingdom, I solemnly instruct you to proclaim the word of God and stand upon it no matter what. Rise to the occasion and preach it when it's convenient and preach it when it's not. Preach it in full expression of the Holy Spirit with wisdom and, and patience as you instruct and teach the people for the time is coming 
when they will no longer listen and respond to the healing words of truth, they will seek out teachers with soothing words that line up with their desires, saying just what you want to hear. They will close their ears to the truth and believe nothing but fables and myths. So be alert to these things as you overcome every form of evil. Carry in your heart the passion of your calling as an evangelist and fulfill your ministry's calling. Now look, there's a lot of false teaching out there. This is like the second part of this. And, and it all sounds so good. I mean, they got some dynamic speakers out there that can spew, just talk about nothing. You can go to their, you can go to a church service nowadays, get in and out in an hour or less, and feel good about the sin that you're in. There's no conviction by the Lord. As a matter of fact, the lies that they're spreading and the lies that they're saying to many people is it's okay God understands he loves you anyway and it's got a part tr part truth in there because God does love you yeah. no matter what you've done he's never going to stop loving you never. but he's never going to approve of it either right. and there's dynamic speakers and they can seem to make sense out of a lie but Jesus said in the same thing in the culture of society, and this right here, he said, there's going to be false teachers and false prophets in this season, and many are going to be deceived. So let me ask you a question. Can a Christian be deceived? You might think, no, it could never happen to you. I've seen many mature Christians deceived with false doctrines. I've seen many. I've seen some in this church when the greasy grace was going around, I've seen people hop right on that bandwagon and start preaching what other preachers said without digging in the word of God for themselves and finding out, getting revelation for themselves. And I'm sure Lot, Abraham's nephew, thought the same thing. I, I, could, never, I could never be deceived. I could never fall away. Does Chris bring up the next one, please? Here's what I want you to see in this. This is how this is a way deception works. We know Lot when he was with Abraham, he was blessed and he was prosperous. As a matter of fact, the Bible says he was so blessed that the land couldn't keep them all they had. They had so many sheep, they had so many oxen, they had so many all animals, they were so blessed. And so Abraham said, listen, the land can't handle us. Wherever you choose to go, I'll go the opposite way. Or if you want to go this way, I'll go that way. So this is what happened. They were so blessed, an enemy came in and he caused strife to happen between Abraham's herdsmen and Lot's herdsmen. Do you know the story? As a matter of fact, the strife was so heavy that they couldn't even talk with each other. It even separated Lot from Abraham. You go this way, I'll go this way. So Lot took all his possessions and he moved near the city of Sodom. He didn't go in it right away. He went near it. Let me see where I am. And we know this, as a matter of fact, when we get back. Strife kills and division kill friendships. They do. Kills relationships. Kills churches. Who's ever heard of something called church splits? We used to see them a lot in the 80s, and they would happen, especially in voting congregations. Say you had 100 people in your church, and you wanted to do something, and they split over something stupid, like carpet color. 50 of them wanted blue, 50 of them wanted red. Well, the people who lose get mad. They leave the church over it. They split over it, over something stupid. You would think by now, all these years later, that we wouldn't have things like that, but it still happens. When the enemy comes in like that, he tries to divide and conquer. And Abraham didn't allow strife and division, but he stayed in the blessing. Abraham said, okay, you go whatever way you want to go. I'll go the opposite way. 
And Abraham stayed in the covenant. He stayed in the blessing. And the next thing we see is Lot living outside the city. The Bible says it was because it was appealing to his eyes. It the green and well watered. It, it looked like the best thing. And he, and he still had flocks and herds and servants. But from this time on in Lot's life, you don't hear him mention the Lord at one time. He might have had all his prosperity still, <coughs> but he didn't have his covenant relationship right. with the Lord. He was distracted and he was deceived and he fell away. The next thing we see Lot and his family living in the city of Sodom. The Bible says that the city was exceedingly wicked in the eyes of God. And we know that wicked is another word for twisted. Everything was twisted. Even uh, where um, you don't see anywhere and you don't read anywhere in this story when he's in there that anything that he saw or heard bothered him. As a matter of fact, you don't see anything bother him anymore. What you don't see anymore is once he's in the city, you don't see his wealth anymore. You don't see his flocks anymore. You don't see his servants anymore. Your herds never mentioned again. So next we see Lot as a leader sitting in the city gate. By this time, we don't know how long it was that he was separated from Abraham and separated from God, but uh, the Bible says that Lot was completely vexed. Now this scripture says, God delivered Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked, for that righteous man dwelling among them and seeing and hearing vexed his righteous, righteous soul from day to day with their unrighteous deeds. Vex means it's worn down by what he saw, what he heard, what he let in his gates. It's what you let in your gates, your eyes and your ears and what you let out of your mouth that determines um, if you're going to be oppressed or not. I tell people, I won't watch certain things, I won't listen to certain things. Because uh, there's a spirit behind it. And you, if you don't believe me, you'll, you'll find out one day, hopefully you won't get vexed on your way. He was, he was worn down by what he saw, and it led to uh, oppression. It affected him and overpowered him so much that when the angels came to deliver him, he didn't want, want to go with them. They had to kind of like put pressure on him. And when the angels came into the city, the men of the city wanted to have relations with the angels. So how far down do you have to go when he brought the angels in his house and the men of the city knocked on the door and said, we want to know them? Lot opened the door and said, here, take my young virgin daughters instead. That you're willing to give up your family, especially young virgin daughter, to the wickedness of the city. And then the angels had to force him to leave. Yeah. And then his testimony didn't have any bearing on the rest of his family. You know why Abraham uh, went to 10 people when he was wheeling and dealing for intercession with God? If there's 50 righteous, if there's 40, if there's 20, if there's... You know why he stopped at 10? Because that's how many family Abraham had in the city. Lot had other sons and daughters that were married and living in the city. And the Bible says that he tried to convince them to leave with him, but they thought he was joking. They didn't even think he was serious. He had no witness, no testimony, no convincing of his own family that God was going to do this. And then on the way out of town, his wife looks back, turns into a pillar of salt. It, didn't, it wasn't just the action of looking back. She was desiring that, her heart. Jesus said, remember Lot's wife. Yes. He, she was desiring that more than she was desiring this. And then Lot leaves with his two daughters. That's all that's left out of ten people is three. And the same two daughters, virgin daughters, he tried to give to the wicked men of the city. By the time he got to Zohar, he didn't go into the city, but he stayed in a cave. The first thing they did was get him drunk and have sex with him. They were corrupted from what they had seen, 
and what they had heard, and it came down from the head. All that when he left covenant, when he left the Lord. I'm about done. Hallelujah. And here's the thing that Jesus said. He said, the coming of the Son of Man will be just like the days of Lot. Just like it. The only way not to be deceived, and because deceived people don't know they're deceived or they wouldn't be deceived. Right. If you're deceived, you don't know. No. Is to be in agreement with God's word. And by agreement, I mean you renew your mind to it. You change the way you think. I don't hate what I've talked about today. I don't hate anybody. I really don't hate anybody. Even though if I don't like what they do, I don't hate them. I love them. With the, I love them. And I want to see better for them. But we have to renew our mind and change our way of thinking to agree with God's word. And then, in order not to be deceived, that's the first thing you have to do. The second thing you have, you have to start doing it. And you have to start saying it. And you have to start making a stand on it. Or you're going to be one of the ones that are going to be deceived by the culture of the society. It's not going to have an impact on you anymore. And the Lord led me to go in this direction today. Talk about the seasons. And he led me to go into this deception today. Because I want to, one of the reasons is because I'm your shepherd, pastor of this flock, but the other reason is there's such a strong deception in the world right now, and it's easy to get caught up in. It's real easy because it, it sounds like kumbaya, it sounds like peace, it sounds like this, but it's not. And when, the, and when there's a time of harvest, pay attention, when there's a time of harvest, they take the wheat and they, and they throw it up in the air and the chaff blows away with the wind. But the wheat stays back. There's a separation coming. We're seeing it already. We're seeing it in churches already. There's a separation. There's a shaking. And we think, oh, people are being shaken up. God's the one who's doing the shaking. God is the one doing the shaking. And there's a separation. Just make sure that you're on the right side of the separation. Stand with me, please. Do you know in the middle of that time where Lot was living in, as soon as he left Abraham's covenant, that the enemy went in and captured him? And what happened after that? Abraham went in and rescued him. And then when he was getting ready to have the judgment of God fall on him, Abraham was the one who made intercession. You're here in this season for a reason. And there's going to be an end to this season too. Jesus. Thank you, Father. We bless you, Lord. We thank you for your word today, Father. We thank you that it is a true word. And we ask, Lord, that you would imprint it upon our hearts and minds today. Lord, that the ones that know the difference between right and wrong, the ones that are not caught up in the culture of society, might be able to free, might be able to help set free the people who are bound and prisoners. And we might be able to pray our families and other Christians and that are in a black backslidden or cold position. We ask you to, Father, empower us with the Holy Spirit and give us the words to say and give us a stand. Lord, give us a stand for righteousness that we won't be caught up in whatever is going on in the world, God. But we'll have the strength and the power to overcome it. Jesus prayed and he said, I don't pray, Lord, that you take them out of the world. I just pray that you keep them from the influence of the evil that's in it. And that's what I pray for this congregation.
today. And those watching, I pray that you keep them from the influence of this world. In Jesus' name.